Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or, or this is this is more an uh, interactive thing, so um, just put your hand up and stop me if there's anything you don't understand or anything you'd uh, like to ask a question about. Um, because I think there's nothing more awkward than leaving all the questions to the end and then there's no questions. So <laughs> feel free to put your hand up. Um, well, I'm going to be talking about a specific kiosk project um, to do with uh, payment systems and smart ticketing and how we arrived at where we arrived at. So it's, um, it's quite a sort of convoluted background, but it, what, what we're going to see here today holds true for many kiosk projects, basically um, solving a customer's problem with the use of really clever technology and self-service. So uh, like I say, feel free to ask any questions. So it's about buses I'm going to talk today. Um, we've done quite a lot in the transport space and um, specifically uh, we're going to talk about Southwest buses and a scheme we're introducing for them. Um, existing bus networks, and this is true all over the country apart from these boys, are uh, heavily cash based. Um, the problem is cash is a pain in the neck. No, no more so than the Southwest. Now, apologies to anyone who was here for my last Kiosk Summit um, speech. Was anyone in, in this room here for that? Ace, because we're going to do the same thing, basically. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to do the same thing. But, but this uh, plays with that same theme, um, which is, I'd like to ask a question here for Southwest Buses, which is essentially Bristol, and they're cash-based, so they drive up to a <coughs> stop, they take on a person who pays cash um, as a fare, how much of their time is spent stationary at the bus stop taking money or giving out change? Guess. Neil, give me a percentage. Percentage of their time, their total drive time, how much is spent stationary? 5%. Um, that's an interesting guess, it's wrong. Has anybody else got any numbers that will throw at me? 20 is a good guess. Any advance? Any advance on 20? It's like an auctioneer. 30. 30. All right, we'll stop there. It's 35. So 35% of the bus's time is spent buggering about giving out change. So that's rubbish, isn't it? That's absolutely rubbish. So obviously, this, this, this gets even more ridiculous, actually. So, so Bristol knew they had a problem. That's the problem. Um, but at the same time, they run a transport system with lots of different operators. First, Arriva, um, well, they're the main two, but there's another one as well. So you'd think um, <coughs> they'd come up with some solutions to this problem, but because there's the council and there are the bus operators, it's not joined up thinking. So first, received um, some complaints in the Bristol press about high bus fares. So what did they do? They reduced the bus fares. So there's even more people getting on with cash, so it got even worse. So, so this is a, a, a pretty poor problem that, that, needed some, that needed some solutions. Now, first, um, first group, the bus operator, did have the idea of introducing M-ticketing, which is smartphone, buy a ticket on your smartphone, show the barcode to the driver, get on the bus. That's really quick. So that's good, that's technology, um, it's, it's fighting back against the use of cash. The fear is, from bus operators, if you offer the option to use cash to your consumers, they'll pay cash. Um, these boys have been very successful at stopping that, but it's a bit different for Oyster, as I'm going to um, tell you. So the idea is that they want a seamless concept. They want people to be able to buy a ticket before they get on the bus, because if they buy it before they get on the bus, then they don't have this change in cash rubbish. So how, how do you do that? How, how do you get to that situation? Because if someone's coming up to a bus stop and it's different operators, Arriva, no, um, Arriva uh, Metro, you know, First, whoever the operator is, you, how do you know before you get on the bus that you've got a valid ticket? Um, it, it, it's a big challenge. Enticketing would sort that out because it's electronic, it can go across all networks, but not everybody's picked up on M-ticketing, -ticket, nor everybody has a smartphone. I'll show you one really foolproof way to do it. That's in Rome. So you put in a, any bus, 
you come on the bus, you put in one coin, one coin, and in this case it's a euro, you get a time-stamped paper ticket from the receipt printer. I mean, that's the sort of a kiosk, but it's a pretty rubbish kiosk. Um, and then you're allowed to travel anywhere you want for 75 minutes. When your 75 minutes is up, you've got to get off. So it, it, it's quite a good system, but obviously it's limited. And it's limited because in the UK, we don't have a public transport system that's paid for by entirely the public purse. It's subsidised by local government, but it's not paid for by them. So there's commercial operators in there, Arriva, First. They've got shareholders. They want to make money. So they don't want fair evasion. They don't want people... They don't want the thought of someone staying on more than 75 minutes um, or buying the wrong fare. And so that's why cash has been so preponderous, because although it's expensive and time-consuming, you do get the cash. Um, Inspectors, we, we, we don't really like inspectors on UK buses. Um, it's something they have a lot of on the continent. Inspectors are, are, are very common on the continent. Um, and that's why they issue very high fines. Um, and if they don't issue fines, they call it uh, Schwarzfahren in Germany, um, uh, basically people who don't pay. And they, because they're publicly operated transport companies, they allow a small amount of wastage. Well, that's abhorrent to UK operators. So they want to capture all the money, um, but they want to take cash off. So, so how do you do it? Well, what they want is they want oyster. That's what they want. They want they want tap on, tap off. Oyster work. Rather than ask this, well, let me ask a different question. Who in this room hasn't ever used oyster? One person. Okay, two, two. Well, I, I, I'm surprised it's that many. I'm surprised it's that many. So I don't need to explain to you what this is. Tap on, tap off. Oyster works, but it works because it's a closed system, and Transport for London control all of it within that system. So, whilst everybody wants oyster in the UK, it can't work. Certainly in the Southwest, there's three different operators. So an oyster card, where it's all controlled in one purse, it, it isn't going isn't to work. Um, so there are other ways. There's um, obviously mobile phones. We've talked about um, ticketing. There's another idea, which is um, mobile beacons. So you register your phone, you get on the bus, you travel the journey, the, the bus knows when you get off, and then it bills your phone. But again, that's only going to work for people who've got a smartphone. So that technology, that mobile beacon I've just talked about, it, it is not there yet. Um, you know, and so what... What is the right way of doing it? And also this tap on, tap off, whilst it works for people that are used to Oyster, it's completely alien for anybody travelling on a bus outside of London. It's really a system for the tube. And you only tap it because there's a barrier. It's so tempting to not tap it if there wasn't a barrier. So we, we need a way to find out how, how we can capture the revenue, how we can stop the queues, and how we can um, basically increase the speed throughput of the buses. Um, so the other thing to think about while we're, while we're talking about this is what's been a real success in London, which is contactless or EMV as we call it. Now hands up, who has used contactless on any TFL transportation? That's not as many as I'd have thought. That's not as many as I, I thought a lot more people would do it. So. So that's a really easy way to pay, and yet the take-up isn't quite as high. And you're all very sophisticated consumers. I mean, I can, I can tell that. So, so given that fact, when you go on the buses, which is a different demographic to the people who travel in London, is EMV going to work? Is contactless going to work? And there's another risk with contactless. When you go um, through the barrier with your contactless card in London, uh, TFL take a zero pence transaction. So they take a transaction but no value. So they've captured your card details. Then when you go out, um, they will charge you, depending on the length of your journey and the amount of time you've been on the system. I'm sure you're all aware of that. And if you don't tap out, say there's no barrier and you don't tap out, they'll charge you the maximum fare permitted for that, for that, for that, for that day. They'll charge you a whole day's travel pass. So you always want to make sure you tap out. Now, 
What I don't think everybody realises is if you haven't got enough money in your bank account to pay that fare, you don't pay. You, you don't pay. You go on a deny list, and then on that deny list, the next time you go to London Underground, you can't get in the barrier because you're on the deny list. Now, that doesn't really work for transport operators of buses because you've gone. So, so the next, you might be making, you might go to Bristol, you make one journey, you might not come back to Bristol for two years. You don't care. So, so you can't get a bris, bu, a, an Arriva bus in Bristol won't let you on. Well, so what? I'm not going to go there again anyway. Whereas you're all going to come back to London at some stage. And your car might have changed and you might get away with it. But very few people take that chance because they don't know when they're going to need an emergency tube journey. And they don't want to risk getting blacklisted. But that works on a closed system like London. But it doesn't work on a, a multiple operator system like the Southwest. So there's some of the factors involved. Um, you might think we're going around the houses, a bit like driving a bus really, but um, we are getting back to kiosks really, but this is the background of the kiosk system we're, we're implementing for the Southwest. So what the solution we've arrived at is smart ticketing. So that is an Oyster card, and this is one I prepared earlier, a smart ticketing kiosk. So it would be good if I could get out of the wallet. It's stuck in. Ha, got it. So that's the same data as is on here. It's an ITSO smart card, which is um, the, the system, um, the industry standard for smart cards. Um, we, we've developed a kiosk that can print, take a photograph of you and print your face on the smart card. Because obviously, if that's a season ticket, that might have 900 quid on it. So you, you want to put your running photograph on it. Um, now, uh, that's not really... The, the, the system of printing onto smart cards hasn't been a massive runner yet. And it's very new technology. But I just thought I'd show you to show you some, something, something a bit different that a kiosk can do. So it's, it's encoding a smart card with value. It is printing onto the smart card a picture of your face, which you can mess about with. You know, like photo booths where you can make it bigger or smaller or move it up and down. So that, that's that one. And the way, the way Bristol wanted to do it is they are putting a, a kiosk at every Metro bus stop to sell Smart. Now, Smart's good because you can, you can top up this online. Like an Oyster card, if you put your Oyster card in online, you can top it up, or you can do the same with this, and then you tap to collect it. Um, and the other good thing about Smart is how do you how do you top up Smart through your mobile phone? Well, you can buy a Smart Value, and then if you've got an Android phone, not an Apple yet, but if you've got an Android phone, you put your phone to the Smart Card, and that tops up the Smart Card. The NFC device in your Android phone tops up the smart card. We could do it with Apple, but um, our Apple kind of won't let us really, because they want Apple want you to use Apple as the smart card. Sorry, they want you to use Apple Pay as the smart card. Um, sorry, as the EMV card. But as we just said, that's not going to work because buses are nervous about EMV. And Apple Pay, it's not quite the same as the EMV, but. Uh, you know, it uses the same transmission technology as, as contactless. Um, but the other good thing about this is that the bus customer who's only got cash can go to a local shop and buy a smart card from the local shop, any local shop, using a company called PayZone. So here's the actual kiosks that we're going to be providing. Um, if I walk over here, the mic's still going to work. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Okay, so that's the, um, these haven't gone in yet, but the, they're, they're about to go in, and I thought, uh, that's the um, size of the kiosk, 3.1 meters tall. Um, basically, this is the transactional bit, which is very similar to Oyster, where you can buy a smart card and it'll, it'll vend the smart card from, from the kiosk, and then once it's vended the smart card, you top it up to add value, and it works in the same way as Oyster. It's a very similar mechanics to Oyster. On the, on, the, on the rear of the kiosk here, this is the journey plan, um, the bus route from that stop. But the interesting thing about that is that's old technology. That is a piece of paper behind glass. 
So we, we tried to say, oh, I'll have a big touch screen there, and you know, they could do some journey planning. And they said, nah, it's too expensive, just put some paper in. So that's paper behind glass, which is a bit rubbish, but as you can see, if, if it's, um, this is all black glass, so because it's black, it, it, it looks pretty cool. And then at the top, you've got uh, um, RTI, real-time information. So what that does, that tells you when the next bus is um, and, and where they're going to. And so this way, you're never going to hopefully get on the wrong bus. But if you do get the wrong bus, you're only going to pay a maximum of so much per day because it's smart. And the other thing about smart is you've got all your concessions on there. So if you're um, under 16, if you're disabled, if you're 60 or over, all that data is held on there. So it's a very clever piece of technology in a smart card. Um, and again, those concessions aren't on your contactless card. So that's another, another advantage of smart for the, for the operators. Uh, the other thing about this kiosk, um, on the side, you can't see it there, is you've got a pickup post. So that's a pickup post. That's when you've you bought your card on your, your ticket online or your season pass or your carne, which is a bundle of let's say five tickets. You, you bought those online, you go up to the pickup post and you collect the value onto your card. And that's here on the side. So if someone's buying a card, and this will vend a, a fresh card out here, this comes out the front, someone's there, you can queue bus, go on the side of the same machine, so the same kiosk can do two transactions at the same time. Um, which I think is pretty, pretty clever. Uh, they're all waterproof, they're all on, on the street, and uh, like I say, they're at every, every bus stop. Um, that's, that's pretty complicated, that, and I think in terms of time, um, I, might, uh, I, I might not go through that, because it's just about how the, how the money flows through. But essentially, the money flows through from here to Travel West, and then Travel West divide it to the different operators. So the work isn't done on the smart cards, the work's done in the back office, and then each operator sees how much money they've collected, from what customers, on what routes, they won't know the customer if they haven't registered a smart card. A bit like Oyster, you can register your Oyster card to you if you want. If you don't want to, you can travel anonymously. So they'll just know customer X has gone from um, Western on sea to Bristol city centre. Or they'll know John Jones has done it if John Jones has registered. And then that, that electronic purse divides the money between the operators. Um, now you could say, why, why are Bristol going to bother with all these, all these kiosks? when most people will use paper, because the ticket, the, the kiosk, will still sell paper tickets, i.e. a tool roll with a barcode on. So why, why would you do it? Um, or, or, or an M ticket, a, a mobile ticket on smartphones? Well, the problem with both those things is it's only going to work to get the data and to do the accounting if there's one operator and there aren't. That you know, you can stand at a bus stop in Bristol, and three different buses will pull up, pull up at that bus stop. So this this system means you can have a hundred different operators if you want to, and all sorts of different consumers on all sorts of different routes. And the technology, the smart card, takes takes care of it. So it's really clever technology. And so the the other thing about the TVMs, just a, a little a little thought for the future is. Once they're in the ground, obviously they're street furniture then, and they'll be there for you know at least ten years, maybe maybe even twenty. Um, uh, so you, you want to make sure with that infrastructure you've got flexibility. So we're putting in uh, beacons, um, which is basically that's the technology that will detect your phone um, and pick it up as you if you put it on a certain app, it'll pick it up as you get on a bus. It'll see how far you've travelled. And then it will, um, when you get off, it will stop charging you. It'll charge you for that journey. So the technology's there now. I mean, Chilton have got a trial. Chilton Rail have got a trial whereby they use Bluetooth to track you on a train. So you don't buy a ticket. You have an app on your phone. And you, you go through the gate using Bluetooth. And then um, you travel on the train and you get off. This is only a trial. But you get off, you go to the barrier. It detects you and it opens the barriers. I mean, I've got all sorts of worries with that in the you know, suppose you open the barrier, it detects you on the phone, and then someone else runs through in front of you. You know, so 
that's just my little worry. But I mean, that technology is here. So I think we can't really fight um, mobile phone technology. We've got to sort of um, sort of go go with it, really. Um, so, so we're putting those into the kiosks, even though it might be redundant technology, even though it might never get used because the cost of a little beacon is not a lot, but to, to, to decide to retrofit technology is dead expensive. So we're trying to future-proof the, the, the kit, really. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think I'm in the time. Um, that's it. Thanks.